Hello, and welcome to my talk. Today I'm going to tell you about some nano absorbents for chromium-6 that we developed in my laboratory. Chromium, with a valence of plus 2 or plus 3, is actually an essential dietary component. However, in a valence of plus 6 or hexavalent chromium, it can be very hazardous. It is a carcinogen, a mutagen, and is very bad for the environment. Unfortunately, chromium-6 has found its way into our tap water here in the U.S., uh, particularly in areas of high industrialization. We get some runoff. Uh, this is actually the basis of the film Aaron Brockovich. So how does chromium get into our environment? You can see it has a number of different forms uh, from a number of different industries that allow it to enter into our water system. Our solution involves electrospinning polyacetonitrile nanofibers with iron nitrate, carbonizing those, and using those fibers as chromium-6 removal nanoabsorbents. Since they have the iron in there, they can also be used for magnetic recovery. For those of you not familiar with electrospinning, this is the basic setup. So we have a syringe pump where we would load our PAN iron nitrate solution. We would pump that at a specified rate to the syringe, apply a voltage from our high voltage power supply. And as the electrostatic forces overcame the surface tension of the droplet that would build up on that needle, a jet would be ejected, a polymer stream would be ejected, and it would be collected up on either a rotating drum or a flat plate. To the left, you can see a table of our compositions of our fibers. You can first see the pan fiber labels, right, with the corresponding iron nitrate weight percent loading on there. So PF5 has a 5% iron nitrate load. Then after carbonization, PF5 turns into CF5 for carbon fiber, five, right? It's the same fiber just after carbonization. And you can see the after carbonization iron weight percent on that table as well. Here you can see some SEM micrographs of the morphology of some of the as-spun fibers. So this is the PF fibers before the carbonization process, right? So PF0, no iron nitrate in there. Look very similar. We get very nice, uniform, pretty smooth fibers. PF20, 20, 20 weight percent iron nitrate loading. Very similar size, right? It didn't greatly affect the diameter of the fibers or anything. Now, once we start getting into the higher iron loadings, however, we see a natural alignment. And this is not due to anything we're doing special with the electrospinning unit. We're not trying to align these fibers. They are naturally doing this because of that higher iron loading. And you can see the iron's pretty well distributed, that inset on the PF50 to the bottom right there. Um, you can see the EDX showing nice uh, distribution of iron there. So with the low weight percent iron, we're getting randomly aligned fibers. With the high weight percent iron, we're getting self-aligned nanofibers. To the left, you can see the basic outline of the pyrolysis of our pan nanofibers, first going through stabilization and then carbonization. Conventionally, this is done in air, or at least the stabilization portion is done in air. But we propose doing both stages under nitrogen because we actually get some oxidative stabilization via our iron nitrate. Now we see the SEM micrographs of our carbonized fibers, and you can see CF0, which was previously before carbonization, PF0, so those correspond. Uh, you can see that our fiber is completely melted, right? When we don't have uh, enough stabilization in there, enough oxidation, uh, we completely lose our morphology. But for the CF20, CF30 and CF50, you can see our morphology is preserved, as well as that self-alignment in the ones with higher iron loading. You can see that we get larger iron nanoparticles on the surface of these nanofibers, and for the EDX in the bottom right there, you can see smaller iron nanoparticles inside of the nanofibers. 
to see how much the iron loading actually affected this alignment or the self-alignment, we looked at the degree of alignment, which you can see the equation in the top left there, uh, where the DA of 0.5 is an ideal non-woven mat, and a DA equal to 1 is a perfectly aligned, all in the same direction mat. You can see to the right that we actually got so much alignment with a uh, rotating barrel <laughs> that we had ended up having to switch to a flat plate collector because they were forming this unique kind of 3D wheel-like structure. So what we hypothesized was true. Basically, the more iron there was in our sample, the higher the alignment. And you don't see it too much until about uh, the PF30 and PF50. And you can see the alignments preserved the, for the CF50 uh, in the bottom right graph there. And about 68% of our PF50 nanofibers deviated from an average orientation within only 10 degrees. So these are pretty well aligned. We wanted to do an FTIR analysis to confirm that we're uh, actually getting pan and iron nitrate in there. And we are. Uh, we actually see an intensity ratio of NO3 to CN with increasing iron nitrate in there. You can see the FTR for the iron nitrate as well, and the IR inactive carbon for CF20, CF50 up in the top right. This confirms our successful carbonization. In the XRD analysis, you can see the low iron content, the CF5 and CF0 with no iron in it, uh, that those almost look very, very similar to that very, very low amount of iron. But as we increase the amount of iron, so going from CF10 to CF50, we can see the graphite crystallite structure uh, and those peaks becoming sharper and sharper. The XRD analysis showed multiple iron faces. For CF50, inside the dotted red box, we saw alpha iron on the surface of our nanofibers. We believe these can initiate the fast removal, at least the initial removal, of chromium-6. We also saw gamma iron and iron carbide inside of the nanofibers, those are the smaller nanoparticles, and these can help for a sustained removal up to 30 days. We saw no iron oxides in the CF50 samples. And down low, you can see the CF20 and CF10. And in those samples, we saw no alpha iron. The main takeaway from the Raman analysis is that as we increase our iron loading, you can see to the right there, as we increase our iron loading, we become more disordered. Makes sense, the iron crystals are disrupting that structure. Our thermal analysis shows on TGA on the left and DSC on the right. Uh, you can see we separated it into four phases. In the first phase, that's where our fibers are basically all stable. Uh, and the second is where we, be, we begin to see a lot of weight loss in the TGA. And then that third region, stage three, is where our stabilization begins. And stage four is our actual carbonization. Um, you can see the greatest loss uh, is in that stage two. Um, but the stabilization temperature, which we can see in the DSC, as it's much more sensitive to phase transitions, we can see that just with a small amount of the iron nitrate, uh, we shift that uh, exothermic peak down. And you can see as we increase that amount of iron nitrate, that shift, that peak shifts back right towards higher temperatures. For chromium-6 concentration determination, we developed two calibration curves, one over the range of 0 0.01 milligram per liter to one milligram per liter, and the other, the direct method, from one to 100 milligram per liter. The colorimetric method is taken at 532 nanometers, and the higher concentration direct method is taken at 350 nanometers. And these both validate the Beer-Lambert law. We'll be working with a few terms over the next few slides, so I want to introduce them now. The removal percentage in percent 
which is the initial concentration of chromium-6 minus the after-treatment concentration over initial times 100, or removal percentage, and the removal capacity, or Q, in milligrams of chromium-6 to gram of nanoadsorbent. So Q is equal to the initial concentration minus the after-treatment concentration times the volume of the liquid over the mass of the nanoadsorbent. Now let's look at these composite fibers as nanoadsorbents. To the left, you see our fibers at a treatment time of 18 hours, and on the right, a treatment time of 30 days. Graphed here are both the removal percentage and removal capacity. And you can see that we get increased removal percentage and increased capacity with increased iron loading, right? That CF50 performs the best there at the 18 hours. And you can see the CF50 is about nine times better than the CF0. But if we leave it in there and take it out to 30 days treatment time, you can see that the CF20, CF30, and CF50 all get to that maximum removal. And this is due to our gamma iron and iron carbide small nanoparticles inside of the carbon matrix. Let's look at the effect of initial chromium-6 concentration on removal percentage and removal capacity. To the left, we see removal percentage first concentration for both CF50 and CF0, and you can see the CF50 greatly outperforms the just plain carbon fiber. And this is under a time of 18 hours, uh, which kind of points at our sustained removal uh, over a great period of time. On the right, you can see removal capacity for both CF0 and CF50. And you can see that, again, this is at 18 hours, uh, but you can see that most of the active sites of CF50 on the surface are nearly saturated after the 18 hours. And to get up to 150 milligrams per liter, uh, you need that sustained removal, which we see in the 30-day example. Looking at the effect of treatment time on chromium-6, you can see that our CF50 versus CF0, uh, this is a graph of chromium concentration versus time here, that the CF50 greatly outperforms the carbon fiber. Uh, after about a minute, it removes about 53.3 milligrams per liter. After 60 minutes, and after only about a week, uh, we're down to nothing. Whereas you can see the carbon fiber, CF0 on its own, is still above uh, 85%. We also investigated the effect of treatment time on removal capacity, which, as you would guess, the increase in treatment time will lead to an increase in removal capacity. And here we see our CF50 with our max loading to our just plain carbon fibers. And you can see after about a week, we get a much, much higher uh, removal capacity. And our final removal capacity that we determined for this material um, actually does very well compared to other materials under very similar conditions. We also looked at the effect of pH on our chromium-6 removal. To the left, you can see chromium-6 removal percentage versus pH, and you can see the CF50 greatly outperforms the CF0, uh, but greatly outperforms especially at lower pHs, which uh, is pretty common in these types of materials for nanoadsorbents. And you can see the graph on the right, the removal capacity, where the CF0 doesn't even work past uh, higher than a pH value of 2. Uh, but we get kind of these four tiers of performance with the best being towards pH 1. And you can see our predicted predominant chromium-6 species at the various pHs down below. Here's our overall mechanism for removal, uh, with the acidic being on top and the neutral and basic being on the bottom of that fiber to the left. But either way, we believe we have a reduction of chromium-6 to chromium-3, and then adsorption of either the chromium-3 complex or chromium-3 hydroxides. 
So we have developed a easily processable and scalable fabrication method for our carbon fibers, which have a high removal capacity, rapid initial removal, a sustained removal up to 30 days, and can easily be magnetically recovered. In terms of future work, we'd like to expand to other contaminants, increase our removal capacity, and scale up, see if we can scale up these, with a long-term goal of really understanding these materials and bridging the gap between that understanding and realizable methods and materials. To begin wrapping up here, I'd like to thank my funding, the College of Engineering at the University of Alabama, my UA and UTK collaborators, and Mean Lab members. I thank you for coming to my talk. You can see our publication there in Carbon with all this information in there. And I will take any questions.